Hello, I'm Craig McLean and welcome to episode 33 of the Mark 1 Escort RS2000 Reassembly. This will be the first video I'll be putting out in the new year, so a happy new year to everyone. Hope you all have a fantastic year. As you know, the car is coming towards it being complete. So this episode is going to be looking at all the little finishing off things, perfecting areas, you know, finishing off areas, the main one being the dash clocks. I'll be restoring and fitting the dash clocks, which is probably the biggest part of this video. So we'll get on with some of the uh, little tasks I've got in mind now. And uh, let's see if we can get the shell, or the car rather, closer to completion. So I've just been working my way through some of the little niggling jobs that need done. And one of them was this headlight not working. And the absolute numpty of the day award goes to me for plugging the plug on this light in completely wrong. It was never going to work because one of the pins wasn't even plugged in. So that was my own stupid fault. But thankfully, a very, very easy fix. So that's now working. I'll let you see the headlights and all the lights working in a second. Another job I've been doing is, you'll remember the knocking on the video of the first drive. Well, that was caused by a, a gap between the bottom of this nut and the insert. That is now sorted with a nice little washer spacer under. I just needed the correct size washers to sort that out. They're now tight. So that's another little job out the way. I've got to say though, today would have been so much easier if it wasn't for the dog running off with my bloody tools. Right, it's time for a lighting check. Side lights, dip beam, main beam, back to dip. Right, off, and we've got passenger side indicator, driver side indicator, and the same for the rear. Side lights, brake lights, passenger side indicator. Driver side indicator, or near side and off side, I should say, and finally, reverse light. Right. The next little job I'm going to get on with is it might not look it, but this center cap on the steering wheel isn't actually fitted properly. And talking to people, the only way of fitting these little caps is by bonding them on, which I don't really want to do simply because. As you can imagine, when you're driving down the road, you want this section here to be perfectly straight as you're driving along in a straight line. Now, I haven't dis I haven't uh, worked out whether it's perfectly right yet or not. I've done it as best I can in the garage just by rolling the car backwards and forwards. But it might be, you know, it might be there or there when you're driving along and I want it perfectly straight. So I want to be able to easily take the steering wheel on and off and move it on the splines as required. So I want to be able to make this easily come off without having to break glue and re-glue it so the idea i've came up with if i just take off the little center cap so the idea i've came up with if you sit that on in place you'll notice there's a hole right in the center there right in the center of the of the plastic section which aligns perfectly with that little dimple in the uh, top of the steering um, column what I'm going to attempt to do is, because I don't need to go too deep, I'm going to attempt to drill that out for a 4mm bolt, only to a very shallow depth, so we're not really going any further than, than the, the end of the threads. And then I'm going to fit a bolt. So you fit the cap on, you put your bolt through the centre, and then you quite simply clip your centre cap in. If you want it off, you flick the centre cap out, take the bolt off, take the cover off, and there you can get to your nut. Simple as that. But I would imagine this is probably hardened. So it might not be that straightforward, but we'll have a go. Well, the metal was a lot softer than I expected. So now I'm going to attempt to tap it to 4mm or M4. It should tap pretty easy, judging by the way it drilled. But we'll soon find out. It's only drilled to about a depth of about 5mm. Just enough to get a grip with a very short bolt. That's 
That's all I was aiming for. That's it, bottomed out. It won't go any further or it will end up snapping the tap. And there we go. That actually turned out even better than I expected. Fits a treat that and the centre boss is now lovely and secure. And now all finished with the proper centre badge fitted. Job well done that. I can now leave that centre cap on without it falling off every two seconds. So the next little job I've been getting on with is this. Basically a little push button that's going to be mounted in the bottom of the steering column shroud, the bottom edge. It's got two cables soldered onto it and heat shrunk. And then a two pin plug on the end, the other, the other end of the plug will obviously be on the car. And that's going to be mounted in the bottom of the steering column shroud, as I've just said, for the uh, washer jets. There's no button on the car for washer jets. On the early cars, they had a little pump by your foot that you just used to pump. Um, yeah, real old technology, that's the way it was back in the day. But when I did the wiring, I ran all the cables in. And you've already seen the new bottle I've got mounted under the, uh, under the bonnet. It's all run in, all the cables are run in for it. It's all fused, it's all ready to accept the button. So I'm going to fit the button now, I'll show you where that's mounted. Plug it in, and hopefully that should be the uh, washer jet working. It'll just be a simple case of leaning forward in the car. I've already checked that I can, le I can reach the position I'm going to put it in fairly easily. Lean forward, put your hand underneath, push your button, and squirt water on your windscreen. So yeah, that's what I'm going to get on with now. I've got this little button fitted. And that is our button that you can just see there in the bottom of the column. Fitted. And I've just tested them. I'm not going to do it again because I've got water all over the windscreen. But they're working a treat. A little plug plugs into the uh, loom in the car. That looks all nice and neat. It's nicely hidden away underneath out of sight. Right, guys. Bit of an update on parts. I've just received a couple. It's kind of the final pieces of the jigsaw puzzle now. So I've finally got the proper cigarette lighter. This is the really deep one to take the deep original uh, cigarette lighters. This is obviously the socket part I've needed. Um, this just needs a bit of a clean up. And I'm very confident when that's cleaned up, that'll be absolutely perfect. It's missing the bulb. The bulb slides in there to light up the ring on the front. But my mate next door, Anthony, he's uh, got another cigarette lighter with a bulb in and he's happy to give me the bulb to go in this one. So thanks very much to Anthony for that. I'm going to go and grab that today because today's job is to get this fitted. Now then, I've got two cigarette lighters. The one on the right came from GSS Goats, which has got perfect spring, it's great, but it looks like it's lit about a million cigarettes, which is no problem. And the one on the left came from Clayton, which is where this one came from. A massive thanks to Clayton as well, sorry, for supplying me with this. Clayton, as I've mentioned on the channel before, is building an absolute stunning twin cam um, Mark 1 Escort, which looks a million dollars. And he's decided to put a USB port in rather than the cigarette lighter, so... He sold me a cigarette lighter, so thanks very much, Clayton, for that. And he also sent me the cigarette lighter with it. But this one, as you can see, the spring's gone on it. But the element on the back is really clean. But if you look on the side, there's some little pins there. I don't know if you can just see them little pins by my, by my nail. If you, if you bend them pins out, you'll be able to release the cigarette lighter out. And what I'm hoping to do is basically make a good one out of the two. Make the best of the two. Clean element um with the decent spring and i've also on ebay picked up a new um a new sticker for the front to make it just look a little bit neater and make it look you know more mint so yeah that's another, another little job i'm going to get on with today i'm going to get them sorted i'm going to get that fitted and all together that little job out the way that will kind of finish that section of the dash off now then the big one i've been looking for a set of these clocks for a while these are the 130 mile an hour originals for the RS2000. Quite hard to come across. I did get in touch with GSS Goats uh, a while ago, and they had they had one, and and uh, they were going to sell me it. And then when I came to came to the time where I had the money, um, they didn't have any left. So unfortunately, I missed out on that. So I was struggling to find one of these anywhere. Just they they are getting harder to come across. Quite a lot of 110 mile an hour ones. The base models had 110 mile an hour clocks, but I wanted I wanted to stay with originality because there is parts on the car that I am gonna I am gonna start looking at changing back to original. I'll go through that another time. Just little bits and bobs that I want to make more original. Uh, so I wanted the correct clocks. So I put a post on a couple of Facebook um, Mark One Escort, Mark Two Escort, classic Ford restoration pages, etc. 
to see. I put a picture up of um, a set of these and a bit of a description saying, you know, telling people I was looking for them if anyone knew where, um, where you know, anyone that had them or, or if anybody had any lying about. And I got some fantastic replies, a lot of people tagging other people in it. I can't remember the guy's name, sorry, who tagged Barry Rankin in this uh, in the post. And Barry sent me a message and said he had these clocks here, sent me some pictures. I managed to strike a deal with Barry to get these clocks. And I'd like to say a huge, huge thank you to Barry because he travelled from South Edinburgh through pretty bad snowy conditions to Moffat where I met him. So it was about an hour for Barry, about an hour and a half for myself. We met up with Barry and Moffat. Uh, we had a crack for about 45, 50 minutes. Uh, we were going to go to a very, very well-renowned sweet shop there, but it was closed, unfortunately. But we had a real good chat, um, and I managed to get these clocks, which came with the wooden dial, uh, the wooden fascia, which I'm not going to fit. But I have managed to order a brand new fascia. So this front face that you see, with all the silver edges, will be here within the next week, brand new. And the clocks themselves are absolutely great. There's nothing wrong with the clocks at all. They're even complete with the loom and everything that I need to fit them, basically. So when I get the new, uh, the new cowl, I'll be able to, uh, I'll be able to get these fitted properly. Now there is a bit of an issue with getting the rev counter working with modern ECUs. There's a video on Facebook, sorry, not on Facebook, on YouTube rather of a guy I watch, a guy called David Green, and he's put together a video to show you how to make Mark I Escort clocks and Mark II Escort clocks work with modern ECUs. So I just watched that video again last night to refresh my memory. I'm gonna have a bit of a chat with, uh, with David, I think, before I go any further. But he explains in that video how to get them working. So I think I've got an idea now how to get the rev counter working with the Omex 710 series ECU, but we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, so the only other thing is, it's just, I'll maybe have to get the speed already calibrated to work with my uh, gearbox and gear ratios. Um, fuel gauge should work as normal because it's just an original fuel gauge, fuel sender in the tank's original. Oil pressure, well that's capillary, means it has an oil feed to it. So I'm gonna get the pipe and everything to attach that to the block, um, vault, there's no reason why volts shouldn't work, that's standard. Water temperature, again, that'll depend on the rating of the sensor in the um, water manifold, whether that reads correctly, but we'll uh, worry about that when the time comes. But yeah, I'm chuffed to bits for that, and uh, Barry's son, Callum, was actually asking pretty much a day or so after I bought these if I'd put a video out yet. <laughs> and uh, I'm not that quick, Callum, I'm not actually that fast, I'm not renowned for my speed and getting things done. But yeah, thanks very, very much to Barry and uh, and Clayton and everybody who's helped me out with these few parts. It's massively appreciated. I'll now get on and get some of these parts fitted, which is kind of, like I said before, the final pieces of the jigsaw. Well, guys, every day is a school day, as they say. This is obviously the original Ford cigarette lighter. This is the part I've cleaned up. It's now got its new sticker on. Looks great. Now, this is what I use to charge my phone when I've got it on Google Maps, which is one of the reasons I was fitting a cigarette lighter, was for charging my phone when I'm doing long distances for Google Maps or SatNav. Uh, the other was for the look. It looks right, and that's what I want. So it's still not a complete failure, but this device for charging your phone will not work with an original Ford cigarette lighter, simply because that's the length of original Ford cigarette lighter. This one here, which is out my Audi, look at the difference in length. So if you take your uh, charge device and slide it into your Ford cigarette lighter, you'll see there, if I can see in, the pin in the middle, you can see the little pin in the center there, comes nowhere near the bottom pin in the charge in the in the cigarette lighter to chart to to energize the uh, the charger so that will not work with an original Ford cigarette lighter unfortunately so it's going to end up being just for the look so it you know it does look the part it's period correct it looks right but it won't do what I had in mind 
So I will definitely be copying Clayton's idea and putting a USB port in the side of the switch panel out of view. It looks really good where Clayton's put it, so I'm going to copy that idea. Otherwise, I won't be able to charge phones or plug in sat navs on long journeys. Bit of a bummer, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's something I didn't know. And there it is, all together. Got the bulb off from here, Anthony, so it'll hopefully light up that little ring as it did originally. And it's just a shame that it's only going to really be for sure that, because like I say, I'll never use the cigarette lighter because I'm not a smoker. I don't know how many people are who are these days. Uh, and the uh, the USB charger like I showed you before doesn't doesn't fit this style of socket, unfortunately. So yeah, it is what it is. It's just going to be for sure, but. I will put one of them USB ports in in a, in a in a you know not a standout location, and then we can still charge our uh, our equipment when we're doing long journeys. Well, there it is fitted into the dash, even if it is only for sure. The little light does light up. I've checked that, so that's good. Obviously, that won't won't get used, but it looks right in the dash if the carbon fiber doesn't even but you know that's how it's meant to be so i am trying to keep as much of it as i can original and i think that's just a nice little touch so now we'll get onto the clocks well i've started stripping the clocks down just to give them a clean nothing else just to give them a nice clean off they were thick with dust inside they've cleaned up really nice by the time the new fascia goes on these are going to look absolutely mint because there's not a mark on any of the fascias or anything I did take the speedo out because it only comes out with it's only held in by two screws because I was gonna see they're showing twenty thousand miles there as you can see. I was gonna see if I could zero them, but without messing about with it and potentially breaking the speedo, uh, I don't want to take a chance on that. So it's going back together as it is. I'll I'll uh, I'll make a note of the miles now and then I can keep track on it as time goes by, how many miles I've done, etc. But yeah, it does work. I've start I've spun the back, the speedo goes up. The right, the right hand side number does start turning when you when you spin the uh, the drive, so I know that's working correctly. All the gauges look in nice condition. I've just got the glass to clean up now and then wait for the new fascia. So yeah, we're making some progress with the clocks. So I'll get them somewhere near ready to go in when the fascia comes, and then uh, hopefully we can get these in and working. The only other thing that was done differently is the previous owner, or maybe someone even before him, possibly. I had made these little sleeves to go over the two bulbs for your indicator light and charge light. And I know exactly why that's been done. It's been done to direct the light forward through these holes without it, you know, directing the light everywhere within the clock. So all I've done is I've actually replaced them two little cardboard sleeves with little bits of rubber tube which fit perfectly over the uh, over the sleeves that the bulbs fit into. So they'll then back, uh, butt up to the back of this plate be held in place and then all the light will be directed through the front plate so yeah i'm going to fi uh, finish cleaning the glass put these back together as much as i can and then uh, i'm going to start sorting out wiring for fitting them right so you've seen before i've cleaned them up i've cleaned the glass up now as well the glass is now there absolutely gleaming i tried to go back in i just need the new cowl to come and while i've been uh wh while i've been on with the clocks i've decided to give the back a clean up sort out all the wiring and figure out what's what because on my car because it's got a very early loom it doesn't have this multi-plug for the clocks it's basically got individual cables for every part of the clock which i don't want i want the proper plug so clayton again sent me this quite a long time ago i've had it sitting about so now i've got the clocks i've been able to plug that plug into the clocks and figure out what cable does what so i've now marked all that up it's ready for soldering into the main loom which is what I'm going to get on with next, and then it's just a case of plugging them clocks in. So yeah, we're definitely making progress. What do you think, Denzel? Yeah? <whistles> making progress? Yes. And today this arrived. And what a lovely, lovely finish that is. That's going to make the world a difference to these clocks. I really do think these will look like new when I get this fitted, because when you compare it to the old one, there's a world of difference. Now I did want to try and repaint this one black and redo all the rings in silver, but there's supposed to be like a, almost a chrome, like a almost satin chrome, if you like. And my experience with chrome paints is that it's not very good. And I wouldn't have been able to get that one 
looking anywhere near as good as that. So although it was 110 quid, it's absolutely beautiful. I'm chuffed with that. So I'll get these clocks put back together and I'll let you see it all built up together. You'll see a major difference from before and after. So one thing you do need to swap over is these little lenses for your uh, your indicator and your battery charge light. They need put on to the new one. And that looks like they've been stuck on with tape originally. So I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to do it exactly the same. Put them on and then uh, get them built up. There we go. Easily done. Ready to put these little wedges in, which secure the glass and stop it rattling against the fascia. And then get it built back up. Wow. Really, really chuffed to bits with that. I don't think they would have looked any better new. I can't see it anyways. That is absolutely superb. So, so happy with that. Let's get them into the car. But first, we've got to do that plug. Right, I thought I would just explain the wiring for the plug for the clocks. And what you would need to do if you wanted to test your clocks to make sure that they work. And I've seen a few people asking this question, actually. So the colours of this plug, which is the part I'll be soldering into the car, uh, they match up perfectly with the wiring on the clocks. So I assume that yours should have the same colours. And as long as they do, this is what I've found when I've done a bit of, a, a bit of research, uh, well, a bit of working out, sorry, from the clocks as to what each cable does. So we've got a solid blue, and that is for your charge light. I think that's a positive feed from your alternator. I'm nearly sure it is. So that's what the solid blue one is. And then the next two is a black with a white stripe and a black with a green stripe. Them two combined go to your indicator light on the dash to tell you that your indicator is flashing. So that's what them two are. Next one along is a blue with a white stripe. That goes to your high beam light. The high beam light gets its earth from the body, so it doesn't need two cables, it only needs one. That'll be a positive feed, and that tells you uh, when you're on high beam. Next cable round isn't used. It was chopped off. I've soldered a brown cable on, but the corresponding pin on the clocks, there's no cable, so that one isn't used. We move round, we've got a solid brown. This is the earth. Now, you would need to connect that to earth if you wanted to test your clocks. Uh, moving on round again, we've got, uh, uh, I think it's black and, yeah, black and a yellow stripe. That is your switched positive feed. You would need to connect that to positive if you wanted to test your clocks as well. Moving round again, we've got a blue with a black stripe, and that is your fuel gauge. Now that should just be an earth from your fuel gauge sender, from your fuel sender rather in your tank. Uh, moving around again, we've got a grey with a yellow stripe, and that is your display light, so that lights your clocks up. That'll be a positive feed from your lights, uh, obviously, to light up your clocks. And I think that's them all. Um, oh, no, sorry, we've got here a red and a white stripe, and that is your um, water temperature. That'll come from your water temperature sender, which will either be in your block, or in my case, it's in the water rail, in the retro Ford water rail. So that's what they all do. So to test your clocks, you would need to connect your earth and your switched live, as I've mentioned. And then to test your charge light, well, that's straightforward enough to start the car with this. this um, no, sorry, if you were just testing your clocks, rather, you would just need to run this blue cable, a solid blue, to a positive feed. And that should tell you that your charge light's working. Your indicator, one of them would have to go to a negative, the other would have to go to a positive to, to show that your indicator light is working. Um, your high beam, again, you would just need to put that blue and white down to a positive feed to show your high beam indicator light was working. Um, your earth, as I mentioned, that needs to be connected at all times. The switch live needs to be connected at all times. Um, fuel gauge, now, as far as I'm aware, fuel gauge is a negative feed. So if you were to put this cable down to negative, down to earth, this blue with the black stripe down to earth, the fuel gauge should, in theory, go right up full. That's how I'm pretty certain it works. Correct me if I'm wrong. Display lights. Again, all you would have to do to that is drop that down onto a positive terminal on a battery, and that should show that all your battery, all your sorry, um, display lights are working. 
Coming around again, we've got the red and white temperature signal. Again, that would need put down to earth. And again, your temperature gauge should go right up to full if it's working. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So I'm going to solder that into the car. I'll show you where it's going and why I'm doing it. Because I've got loads of individual cables and I'm going to combine them into one nice, neat plug. As most of the later cars were originally. And sorry, I forgot to mention, if you're looking for a new one of these binnacles, this came from a company called Classic Trim, which is on eBay. So yeah, this just came straight off eBay, but from a company called Classic Trim. And it really is nice quality. Hey right, guys, a little bit of an update. I've actually upgraded the bulbs now from the original 501. These are called 501 bulbs to LED equivalents. I'll let you see a little uh, picture now, how they look with the lights out. Now, as you can see, they look really nice and bright. They're absolutely spot on. Um, I think it's definitely worth upgrading from these old um, filament type bulbs to the new LED. So if you just go on the likes of eBay and look for, I just look for super bright uh, Zenon white uh, 501 LED bulbs and if the, most of them give you the length so if you try and get one similar length because the the bulbs in these clocks have got like little blue caps on so if you want to leave them blue caps on if you get really long ones they won't fit in so remember to get the same length as the original it does give you the um the overall length I think these are about 13 mil long something like that anyways one thing to remember if you are fitting um LED bulbs LEDs are a diode that means the polarity sensitive so if you put your bulb in the wrong way because you can put it in any way any two ways if you put it in the wrong way the light won't come on all you've got to do is pull it out turn it around put it back in again and it will work or it should work so just remember that don't go putting your clocks in your car check them first because i actually got two out of four right and then i swapped the other two over and i got a full nice bright set of clocks i'm really really pleased with that some eagle-eyed viewers might have noticed the miles have gone down. I actually decided, with a bit of encouragement from Barry, who I bought the clocks off, to have a go. Now, it's not as easy as you think. There's a load of little pins after a line on a bar. And if you try and turn all the numbers to zero, once you turn them little pins round to go onto the bar, because then pins have got to locate on the bar for the for that to work properly, for the uh, the mile counter to work properly, as soon as you turn them back, you get a different number every time and it's really really difficult to know what you're going to get so i played about for about an hour originally i had twenty thousand and twenty thousand and odd miles and i've now got it down to two thousand five hundred and sixty eight which is as probably as good as i'm going to get i've quit while i'm ahead i'm going to leave it at that uh it's it's low enough i'd like it at zero of course i would but i i'm, I'm just going to make it worse if i carry on and i might end up breaking them if i keep turning them time and time again so i'm going to live with that so yeah much much brighter one more thing i did give you a bit of wrong information earlier if you want to test your battery charge light the signal from the alternator is an earth not a positive as i said it's an earth it gets its positive from the clock it gets its earth from the alternator so if you want to test your light just remember that i've actually tested all the clocks all the gauges work perfectly i'm chuffed to bits about that I can't check the oil pressure, obviously, because it's a capillary. But them three went right up when I uh, when I earthed them out, as I explained. Well, them two went up when I earthed them out. Vol voltmeter went up. Um, all the lights work, so I'm going to call that a success. I'm really, really, really happy with that. So this is exactly what I have when I say that all mine is separate. So I've got individual lamps already soldered in, uh, already part of the loom, rather. So that's the charge light. You've got uh, the red and whites here, there, uh, gauge lights, all the different individual lights, and then you've got all the uh, different individual plugs for um, for things like the fuel gauge and the temperature gauge. So all that there, all that is going to be combined into that one plug I showed you. I'll let you see that when I get it done. It's probably going to take me probably a little bit of time to neaten all that up, loom it in, and have a proper plug, but I'll let you see that very shortly. Right, after a bit of playing around, that's probably been the worst part. I've re-loomed them all back into one bunch. I've now got all them colours written down. I know what every single cable does. They now all need soldered into that plug, loomed back in, and how much neater is that? 
it's far, far neater. The other cables there, they're for ECU feeds for stuff like shift lights and rev counter. The rev counter feed from the ECU won't be any good, but I'll go through that in a later video. And how much better does that look? I'm absolutely convinced in all the years I've been doing auto electrics that soldering and heat shrinking is the best way of doing automotive wiring. That's that's a strong opinion of mine. I really do think it's far, far better than big bulky crimps or, or any other kind of connection for that matter. I think it's really lovely and neat. It makes such a nice job. The only way I could have improved on this is if I'd staggered these joints so it wasn't all in one bunch. But because it's such a short length and because I've got so many cables, it would have been really, really difficult. So I'm, I'm not worried anyways because it's behind the dash. That'll be getting done in the loom strip. You'll see that in a second. I've used the spare cable on the plug that's not used. Uh, I've put a, a label on that to say all pressure because I've connected it to the all pressure warning light that this dash no longer has. So it's just made a space for that cable. So yeah, that's that done. It just needs all loomed in now. I'll get that, uh, get that done now and I'll let you see that in a minute. And there we go. I'm sure you'll agree that is one hell of a difference. That simple one plug plugs into the clock now. I do need to run a cable in for the rev counter. I'm going to cover that in a different video because I'm running out of time. But I do have one more thing to run in today before I fit these clocks into the dash, which I'll show you now. So this just arrived from GSS Goats. I ordered it at dinner time on, I think it was the Tuesday, and by Wednesday it was here. So thanks very, very much to the GS lads for getting this out to me so quick. This is obviously the old pressure feed for the gauge. So that end screws into your block where the pressure switch currently is. I'm hoping that's the right thread. And that end screws onto the back of the clocks. Uh, there's like a little adapter I've already screwed onto the back of the clocks that that screws into. And then there's like a little uh, little doughty washer, a little uh, fibre washer that goes in between. So I'll get that pipe running now. I'll let you see it run in. And then we'll finally get the clocks into the car. And there we have it. That's our all feed pipe run in. And it's actually, as you'd expect, the absolute perfect length. I think it's about two and a half foot, something like that long, maybe three tops. That's running really nice. So I've got the speedo cable, all pressure pipe and the main plug. Like I say, the only thing I do still have to run in is the feed for the rev counter, which I'll cover in the next video. Um, but that is that. Let's get the clocks in and see how it looks. And there we go. That's the clocks lit up. I've got the charge light on for go for an indicator. We get an indicator warning light, the same for both ways. The uh, fuel gauge just went up very slightly, but it's shown that we've got very little in. Volt gauges went up, it'll go up a lot further once we get the uh, once we get the car running and it's charging. Temperature gauge obviously won't move anywhere, and all pressure, I haven't got the pipe connected. But I'm going to leave that there. That's as far as I'm going for this video, I think. We've made a massive step forward. And uh, we're, we're very, very, very close to completion now. We really are. Well, guys, I'm going to leave that there. I'm chuffed to bits with all them gauges. Look, I really am. They look a million dollars, especially when they're lit up in the dark. I think them LED bulbs have really made a big difference there. Uh, I'm absolutely chuffed to bits. I really am. I can't put into words how happy I am with the way it's turning out. The comments I've received of people have been absolutely amazing. Um, a lot of people say, you must be proud of it. And I've got to admit, I am definitely, definitely proud of it. I'm, I'm going to cherish it for a long time, I think, and just enjoy it this summer in particular. Hopefully, we won't have many teething issues and I can enjoy it and get some miles on it. Uh, so the next video we'll be looking at, as I mentioned earlier in this video, I need to try and get the uh, tachometer or rev counter working with the OMX ECU. I have got uh, some information from David Green. Thanks very much to David for all his help with that. And I'm fairly confident I can get it working with the uh, with the uh, OMX ECU, but I'll go into that in the next video. Um, yeah, the next video will probably be just a couple of little other finishing off areas. There's not a lot left in that now. And then I'll be looking at getting it insured, getting it uh, the agreed value, getting it insured, and then probably roll and roll it MOT'd. And then I'm hopefully going to give you a really good video of it out in some nice scenic areas. 
and uh, and let you see it properly and a proper driving video as well. Let you let you hear it on song on an open road somewhere. But that's it for this episode, guys. Thanks very very much for watching. Thanks for all your likes and your subscribes and comments, everything. Really really appreciate it. So I'll see you very very soon, guys, on the next one.